So I'm Sarah Brumfield, and I'm here today with my partner, Ben. And together we're, we're Brumfield Labs, and we, we're the creators of From the Page. Um, when we're feeling grandiose or visionary, we, uh, we say that we are in the business of uh, democratizing the production of history in a grand collaboration between the public and professionals. But really what we do is we run From the Page, which is a crowdsourcing site. <laughs> and today uh, we are going to talk about everything that you or we have seen people do with crowdsourcing. Um, and that is going to cover all sorts of, of different types of projects that we've seen and um, what people are doing. So let's get started. Um, so we cool. are sending out a recording of this. It'll probably go out, it may go out tomorrow, but probably it'll go out on Monday. Um, and if we have any links or things that we mentioned, we'll make sure that they're included in that email as well. Uh, so we try to run webinars like this once a month. Um, sometimes we do repetitions, especially if we're trying to um, do things during times that are appropriate for that, that are more convenient for Europe or Australia and New Zealand. Um, but the next webinar that we have scheduled is um, one on collaborative transcription and research from the Arctic to East Texas. So we've got a couple of different research universities from kind of very different positions within the, the academia in the United States. Uh, there's Dartmouth University Library. And uh, then we have uh, Stephen F. Austin State University uh, in Nacogdoches, Texas, and they'll be presenting on their projects on From the Page. Yeah, we also have lots of other topics coming up that you might be interested in attending. So there's a link at the bottom to, to where those end up. We only get them posted about a month beforehand, so we don't always have all the speakers lined up and the, the schedule figured out. But hopefully you can see the sort of stuff we, we try to be interesting. So <laughs> yes. we don't always succeed. We do try. Okay, let's get started. So what can you do with crowdsourcing? Um, the most traditional thing that you think of, uh, that most people think of when they think about crowdsourcing is transcribing text, generally handwritten text. So this is an example um, of a letter from uh, Jane Addams to May Wright Sewell, who was um, kind of a, a leader in social movements in Indianapolis. And, you know, there's text. It is transcribed. <laughs> that is kind of, of, of what it is. It's uh, transcribed by generally, in this case, one person, but it could be transcribed and then edited by someone else because that's kind of the collaborative nature of crowdsourcing. And one of the important things about this kind of transcription, this is being run by the Indianapolis Public Library. And after the material is transcribed, they're able to bring it into their digital library system so that people can do full text search. Right. right. Before it's transcribed, they just have the metadata that was entered by the staff at the item level or perhaps the folder level, and there are pixels, right? You don't necessarily know what this is going to, to have about alumni associations. Once it's transcribed, it can be searched, which is pretty exciting. Um, so here's another example. Uh, this is actually a uh, recipe book from the North Carolina State Archives. Um, it's a textual transcription um, of a recipe for uh, basically homemade baking powder. And if you look at the very bottom of the screen, you can see where the transcriber uh, went and found a modern representation of this recipe for baking soda. Um, and they, she found it in all recipes and she linked it and, in the comments. And so it's not just about transcribing the text. There's a deeper interaction. Um, so there's another classroom um, that's doing something similar, early modern recipes. Uh, it's a classroom at Wake Forest University. And then the students are taking their recipes and they're doing projects around them. So they're, they're making the thing or they're researching what weird botanicals go into particular you know, particular medicines and and things like that so they're they're transcribing and then they're taking it a step further and and volunteers do that all the time which is fun um once you have text and have text transcribed you can send it and in our system you can send it with a, a button push uh to text analysis tools like voyant so this is a diary of a antebellum tobacco farm in rural virginia it happens to be one that's in uh, ben's family and um, we push this text there and you can see what they talk about. Okay, yeah, tobacco. And they talk about the day and different types of weather. It's, you know, questionably uh, of questionable interest, but it's kind of fun to be able to do this sort of, of analysis of text very, very quickly. Um, 
Another visualization that we actually really love is uh, called Word Trees. So this is uh, a Word Tree that's created by our friends at the George Washington Financial Papers. And uh, so this is an analysis of financial transactions. So it's slightly structured data. And there's a lot of repetition, which makes it very well suited for this type of tree analysis. Um, and what it does is it shows a lot of transactions with Mrs. Bishop. Um, the, the word at the root of the thing is bishop, and then she actually shows up at the top um, as a, uh, and the, the, how big the text is here is how often it shows up kind of in this, in the text. Um, and so Mrs. Bishop is a local midwife. Um, and so you can see that there's a lot of trans, transactions with the mid, midwife um, for delivering babies. And I think that's kind of interesting to see how they talk about the act of having babies delivered and, and, and mix. So, And this is part of a broader effort to kind of understand the Washington family's relationship and control over the enslaved people that they uh, had working on their plantations or on their properties, you know, and, and to what extent they spent money on those people and what kinds of things they spent the money on. And, and it turns out uh, midwives and shoes were one of the things they discovered were the main cash outlays, which is... Uh, which is interesting. Yeah. yeah. So another thing that people can do um, through crowdsourcing is indexing and annotating text, right? Um, and this is something that we see, especially with scholarly projects, whether those are in the classroom or scholarly editions. Um, this is one of my favorite examples. This is from Berea College in Kentucky. Um, and Kentucky in the early 19th century had a number of utopian religious movements, including a group of Shakers um, who were a celibate um, Protestant visionary um, co-educational group of people who, um, you know, live this life and, and, and kept journals of all of their spiritual visions. So the historian at Berea College has his students analyzing the spiritual journals kept by this nearby Shaker community. Um, and you can see that in addition to transcribing these, uh, these documents in the, the, the spiritual journals, they've also um, indexed these angels, the angel love, the angel Vicolin. I don't know who these angels are in these, but, but you have them marking up these terms and then doing additional research on what the Shakers were doing and what their religious beliefs were and what kind of figure this person might have been uh, to them. Um, one of the other things people do with crowdsourcing is they transcribe forms. Uh, so our next example, thank you, Ben, uh, is from the UK National Libraries, uh, sorry, the National Archives. And it's a copyright form for art and graphics. Um, and what they what they do is they set up a form with certain drop downs and some longer fields, and they can add a lot of inline instructions. And so it's, you know, you're, you're looking at a form and then you're transcribing onto a form. Um, one of the things that's fun about this project, if you'll go to the next slide, is that two of the really active transcribers on the project, they go really deep. So here's a link to that particular artwork at the Victoria and Albert Museum. So here's the copyright, and then here's the, the artwork. Um, and then there's a discussion about the writer, whose name is Poole, and the actor, uh, this is, I think, a, a poster promoting a theatrical production, uh, the actor, whose name was tool. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's just fun stuff to catch. And, and, and second, Scrumpy Jeff here, they do this all the time. It's hilarious to watch them interact. But this is what kind of ideal crowdsourcing looks like, that you actually have a community that's collaborating, that builds relationships with each other to do great work for you. Um, Obviously, crowdsourcing improves your findability, and it does it in a lot of kind of different ways. What Ben talked about earlier is you have full text transcription, you pull it into a digital asset management system, and now you can actually search 
you know, at a page level, the, the text that's in a letter or a diary. Um, but this is a different example. So these are World War I uh, service cards uh, for the state of Alabama. And they had each set of, they had cards broken down by sets and they were by county and by surname. So you'd have all of the F surnames for Dallas County in a pile. So if you knew that your person, your ancestor, your great grandfather um, lived in Dallas County and had the last name of Foster, you could go page through all of these cards and probably find his. Um, but there might be 400 of them. Yeah. That you had to page. <laughs> Some of these, the bigger counties, there there definitely were like 200 and 250. So if we go to the next slide, uh, what they did is they set up an indexing project where they asked for certain fields from each card. Um, and you can see, you know, names and hometown and home county and just a handful of, of the information here, but not all of it. Um, and what was fun about this one is they set this up to coincide with the centennial of World War I, and they were thrilled, and we were thrilled when their volunteers managed to index 111,000 of these cards in three and a half months. So Two and a half. Yeah, my, my notes say three and a half, but I agree, two and yeah, a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like 10 or 11 weeks. It was it, really it was very, very surprising. Um, this was the Alabama Department of Archives and History, and their goal was to add more details and then upload those cards as single items. So they had to do some post-processing with the spreadsheets that they exported out of from the page, but then they imported that back into Content DM, and they were able to go from having, you know, these sets by surname and county to having an individual card with individual metadata, which made it much easier to search by certain fields and to drill down and find the exact card of your exact um, great grandfather or whoever you're lo you're looking for. Um, one of the other things that we've seen people do with crowdsourcing is identify photographs. So. A caveat here, this really works best with a set of scoped photographs. So this example is from the Indianapolis Public Library, and it's photographs of unidentified public parks. So it should all be parks, right? We know where the parks are in our own cities, and you know you could identify some of them, maybe not all of them. Um, they use a controlled vocabulary of park names in a dropdown to let volunteers identify that park or identify the, the parks. And so having this limited number of possibilities makes these projects a lot more successful. Um, identifying people is a lot more difficult because you end up with a lot of, that looks like my grandpa, um, which may not actually be the case. It's just like your grandpa has facial hair like your grandpa, but maybe isn't actually your grandpa. Um, if there's a known uh, field of people or places, uh, or maybe you run a project privately with a set of experts, then you're more likely to, to successfully identify photographs. Um, next slide. So this one's interesting. This is this, uh, a slightly different aerial as, as the previous one, but it's not a park. <laughs> so they're like, so even when you have this controlled list of parks, you may have material that doesn't fit in like this one. Um, but the the person who was working on it from the public was able to say, yeah, this isn't a park, but I'll tell you exactly where it is. That V-shaped building is um, this one thing. It's, uh, I think, an alternative school. And you can, he's like, I can tell where it was based on where the, the roads were and stuff. So yeah, so just a lot of interesting extra uh, information about this that does the purpose of this project, which was identify where the heck these pictures are from, right? Um, they ran, this is another one of their park identification that wasn't aerials, it was street views. Um, and I loved this one because someone was looking for where it was and they're under additional information they dropped in a google street view of the same intersection so this red brick building is actually the one you see on the left in the the, the far kind of uh left side of the the original image um so i thought that was really neat and what someone was able to do to kind of double check their work and to provide additional information that places this photo on a map basically so another thing that's really important that's, that we see based on images is making images more accessible. So we've talked about findability a little bit and indexing. Um, I'm talking about here accessibility in a different form. That is, 
web accessibility, making images and other media content more accessible to users who are visually impaired, who are blind, who for whatever reason are using assistive uh, devices to experience the web. Or have broken images and want to know the images, right? Right. So uh, there are a pretty well-developed set of standards for how to make images accessible. And the cornerstone of those is alternative text, the text to present in place of an image if the image is not available. Um, there are specific guidelines for creating alternative text, and there are, you know, there are businesses that will create this for you and those kinds of things. Um, the guidelines are really important because they're informed by people who are using screen readers and who, you know, need to be able to kind of skip over things and navigate quickly. Um, screen Alt text needs to be uh, concise. Um, it needs to be uh, not repetitive. So one of the things that um, the library, the uh, University of North Carolina Libraries approached us about was trying to use crowdsourcing tools like from the page to create alt text. And they might be doing this just as a staff project, um, but it's something that could be done remotely. It's something that requires presenting an image to a user and then prompting them. Um, so in order to enable that, um, we developed a tool that lets people type in alt text with guidelines uh, about how that should be done um, and with constraints to make sure that things are uh, are cons appropriately concise, that they don't go too long, right? that they warn users that, oh, if you're if you're typing this much, you know, this, you, you really well, too much. <laughs> yeah, 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 you'd better have a good reason. And you it. can tell in this little anime uh, gif that we kind of turn kind of an orangey pink. And then as you keep going, it gets redder. And there's yes. a character count on the bottom uh, left there that kind of helps you just keep an eye on how many characters you've done. And then when you hit the hard limit, it doesn't let you type anymore. So, right. so in addition to making images accessible and indexing records, you know, as Sarah talked about with the World Roman Service Cards example, um, one of the most interesting projects that we've seen um, was at the Texas State Library and Archives Commission working with pre-existing handwritten indexes to their collections. So um, this is the Texas Court of Appeals Index. So you have all of these appellate cases uh, in the state government, and they are all handwritten from the 19th century and early 20th century. Um, and at some point, uh, staff came in and created indexes to them, right? So here is the index for appellant and appellee for the A's, right? The, the A appellants and the A appellees. Um, this was a lot of work. It's really important. And it's also at this point, almost completely unusable, right? This is not what we, we want. Either physically go and read it or, you know, look at the version that's online and page through it as if it was an actual book. So the fascinating thing they did was rather than try to transcribe and index the appellate cases from scratch, um, they indexed the indices, right? So they created this uh, spreadsheet trial style transcription project uh, in which they asked their people, and this was an internal staff project, to transcribe the old 19th to early 20th century index, the handwritten index. Once this was done, uh, they were able to export it as a spreadsheet and then post it online in the Texas Digital Archive, which also holds the scanned images of the Third Court of Appeals cases themselves, right? So they were able to take that data and export it from, from the crowdsourcing platform as a CSV file and upload it both as a spreadsheet that people could download, but also as this neat lookup table. So you have this online table in which you can type in names of appellants and names of appellees. It looks at the index and it tells you exactly what uh, PDF page to look on and what document to look on to find what you need. Another thing that you can do is prepare data for analysis. Um, so this is an example that uh, from a project that was run by uh, Sonia Coleman, 
and her colleagues at the Library of Virginia. Um, this is a set of documents that are, are pretty heterogeneous that are the, the three Negro registers of the state of Virginia. So the Commonwealth of Virginia required any African-American who was not enslaved to be registered with their local county. Um, making this data available is a really important part of supporting descendant communities nowadays. But the data itself is, it, it's really complicated, right? It, you've got a lot of detailed data here, but it varies from courthouse to courthouse and county to county and year to year. Um, so what they did was set up, you know, they decided what fields were important and what they really wanted in a findable index, what was really needed to support modern researchers and modern descendant communities. And they set up a transcription project uh, using spreadsheets, asking people to index this information out, you know, to read these registers and to pull out the, the information that they needed for findability. Um, one of the neat things about that is that not only has that been used in the Library of Virginia's uh, digital finding aids and, and digital library systems, but they've also uploaded the results to the Virginia Open Data Portal, right? So this data set lives alongside other data sets from the Virginia Untold project um, that people can download and they can visualize even online, right? You can say, all right, well, you know, let's show me, you know, where people were from and, you know. Which what, counties had the most, you know, free African-Americans in it. Uh, maybe it just correlates to, 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 to population, but maybe not, right? Maybe yeah, they're, they're, move they're, across the state, there it's different numbers. There's some interesting questions to ask. Yeah, you, you can you can do math on this, right? You, you could, you were not able to do math on this, right? <laughs> right, and Sonia is actually on the call today. So when we get to the end, if you have questions for her about that, I'm, she's- It's on. an amazing yes, project. It's a really, really cool project. Um, so one of the other things that we've seen people do is creating metadata. And the first time we saw this was a project out of uh, the Ohio University. And they were just using the standard field-based transcription like we showed with the Alabama World War I service cards. But the, instead of having um, cards with text on them, they had dance posters. And they were trying to describe the posters, which is is totally reasonable. We just never it never occurred to us people would would do this type of of abstraction on top of an item that really wasn't textual. Um, so uh, in this particular case, they built and they created a form that had a lot of very specific two dance posters. Um, who was the choreography? Choreography. Who was the dance company? What was the title of the dance? Um, you know, whatever else they could find. And they used this uh, to, to create metadata for their dance posters. And then they actually, they rolled it into a grant application to do a lot more work with their dance collections with um, their alumni community from that program who would know a tremendous amount about the details of these performances. Um, so that was kind of a neat way to kind of engage a very particular audience. Yeah, it was really expert sourcing, right? These were the people who were there during the production, mm -hmm. right? They were dancing. They were on this. They were they were building stages. It's yeah, it's yeah. really neat. Um, but we also so once we saw that, we're like, oh, this is fascinating. Metadata, right? Creating metadata, which is kind of different from just transcribing what you see on a page. So this is an example of a letter, and it has it's four pages, and you can and this is sort of what we built next was, can you look at all the pages and then fill out a form about this item? Um, so we think that's a kind of a neat thing. And if you go to the next slide, there's actually uh, some projects. This is one at Dartmouth where you transcribe the letter and then you're presented with one of these metadata forms. Um, so our kind of assumption is that uh, the person who just transcribed the letter is probably the person who's most able to fill out a lot of these kind of standard fields like who sent it and who was it sent to and when was it written, especially because, you know, we provide the images and the the, the transcription here that they can kind of refer back to. Um, you know, we know that archives have a lot of other metadata that they create and that the crowd can't necessarily do that, but the crowd can do these kind of, you know, what's the content? Like, what have you learned from transcribing it? What can you and, learn from looking at it? 
And I should mention that uh, Sumara Carey oh. at Dartmouth is on this call. Yes. So uh, I'm going to volunteer her to uh, take any questions about this if people would like to dive in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the other things that we haven't really seen happen yet, but we think is a, a possibility because of how we built that metadata piece, is revising metadata. So when you import items into from the page, depending on where they come from, um, if they come from uh, a system that we have uh, integration with where we can ask for the metadata, we'll pull it into from the page. Um, or you can upload a spreadsheet that goes along with items, uh, and we'll put that in our metadata um, kind of space in our database. And so when you're filling out these metadata forms, you can look at the images, you can look at the transcription, if there is one, and or you can look at the metadata. So there's a lot of projects out there right now that are looking at metadata and thinking about how things could be reworded or uh, what other people are mentioned in the documents that we might like to highlight. And we think this type of metadata revision might is the sort of project that would be interesting perhaps as a staff project or um, like a library classroom project or or something. So. So another crowdsourcing task we've seen um, that has a little bit more limited scope, um, but it is, is successful and can be successful is correcting OCR text, right? So OCR is really great at taking printed documents and generating electronic text, but not every printed document is the same. So this is an example from the Early English Text Society, which was a organization of mostly volunteers um, and, and scholars in the late Victorian, early uh, Edwardian period who published English language medieval material. And as you can see, they invented their own typeface. And the typeface is really hard and produces terrible, terrible OCR. Uh, so this kind of thing needs to be corrected. And so, uh, We've seen projects that are able to import the raw OCR and ask volunteers to look at it and look at the uh, images themselves to correct what they've actually, what the OCR is, and then pull it out into something that's actually readable. We will say that we've also had volunteers who have rebelled and said, this OCR is so bad, I'd rather just type it. Yeah, um, yeah it's not the most exciting kind of activity. Um, that said, we've seen people go in the other direction. Uh, this is a project at the Iowa State uh, Libraries, and uh, they had pretty good OCR from these seed catalogs, but they have users who are using HTML tags to format the OCR and, and match the typesetting <laughs> yes. from the original. Um, I mean, this is just kind of amazing. They've got all the bolding. They've got, you know, the 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 block caps, um, they've got centering, they're just really doing an amazing job here. Um, so they're doing less correction and more kind of enhancement, uh, which is which is pretty cool to see. Um, another kind of activity we've seen is translating text. Um, so this is an example of a medieval document that uh, is being translated into modern English from a uh, medieval Italian. And you can see the users are able to switch between looking at the image and looking at the uh, and the transcript. It's not let's making see. you too dizzy. Yes, yeah, let's, let's get past that quickly. Um, another activity we've seen is transliterating and normalizing text. Um, so this is a project at, uh, it's, it's kind of a big consortium of, 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 of uh, institutions, but they are working on um, the archives of a convent, a Spanish colonial convent in the Philippines. Um, and they are working with modern Filipinos who, uh, many of whom know, know Spanish just fine, um, but they are used to modern normalized Spanish. And Spanish has been through a number of spelling reforms since these documents were written. And so they have people who are not only transcribing the documents, but they're also um, correcting them. They're normalizing them. To modern, um, Spanish. to modern Spanish for accessibility reasons as part of this kind of digital repatriation uh, effort. Uh, a more extensive project is um, this Malaysian example. So these are documents that are written, uh, so they're, they're Malay folklore that are were originally written using the Jawi writing system, which is based off of Arabic. 
Uh, and modern Malays speakers do not use Jawe very much anymore. Um, so to make this historic folklore accessible to Malay speakers, um, this project is transliterating the Jawi into the Latin-based uh, writing system that's used nowadays. Um, so suddenly all this material becomes accessible, even though it's not being translated, but it's being transliterated into the modern script. So that's kind of all of the ideas that we have for you, but it's a lot of ideas. So hopefully it sparks some some questions or some project ideas. Uh, so, you know, we're gonna leave you with the question, what could you do with uh, crowdsourcing? But we're also gonna open up for questions and, um, you know, discussion, yeah. brainstorming, you know, we, we like to talk, we love to talk about these types of projects. So feel free to leave comments or ask questions in the chat or uh, to raise your hand, or if you're as bad at Zoom as I am, to just unmute yourself and, uh, and uh, start talking. Maybe I could even start by asking Sonia yeah, to uh, give a go. rebuttal or clarification mm -hmm. of anything that I got wrong describing the Virginia Untold project. Oh, I think you got it perfectly then. Um, that was a really good overview of what we've tried to do with the spreadsheets. Um, and some of those are controlled fields or they're drop downs so people can select. And other fields were asking people to sort of capture verbatim what is written. So it's a weird mix of controlled versus transcription. Um, so that is something that I think our users have struggled with. And just anecdotally, I'll note that I think that our form transcriptions are more popular than our spreadsheet-based transcriptions. Um, so you may just want to think carefully about what you're asking your users to do um, and what task might be easier for them. And you have a broad range of users who tend to gravitate towards specific projects. Is that right? Um, we do have a lot of different types of users. Um, the ones who work on those spreadsheet projects, those really are our expert users, our genealogists, um, and our staff members. Um, when we are working with high school students, we tend to steer them more towards our World War I forms and other things that are a bit easier to get into. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Hi, it's Julia here. I'm just curious about um, diacritics and accents and, and that one example of the medieval one, I mean, that's um, got some unusual characters. So um, what uh, what do people do about those? So that's an interesting question because there's really two answers. Um, the, the people who are most used to, say, typing in Arabic, Right, um, they already have their keyboard settings, and they're they're great at that. Um, someone who is transcribing a German letter who has a German language keyboard, yeah, that's that's fine. Um, but especially for the medieval projects, or for projects in which um, the script that you're typing doesn't match your own keyboard, um, I mean, certainly, you know, I I can maybe make my keyboard do an accent over an E for French, but you know, it's a lot easier if I'm handwriting it. Um, for those projects, what we see work pretty well is uh, kind of a suite of instructions. And the, the most accessible piece is when people list in their transcription conventions that show up right underneath the transcription form, um, cut and paste these accented characters if you can't use them on your keyboard. Um, and so that's really easy for people to do. Um, then we see a lot of projects actually say in their help, oh, here's how to set up your keyboard as an international keyboard, or here's how to here's how to do alt and number number pad to make those characters work. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much the extent right. of the software that. supports it, but getting it in is always hard as if even if you were typing in you know Word or or Google Box. Yeah, and, and I mean, one of the medievalist projects, um, they actually wanted to, to differentiate between different letter forms. So they wanted to differentiate between a long S and a round S, or between a, a standalone R and one of the R's that's connected to the letter in front of it, an R rotunda. And no keyboard has that, right? So they absolutely had to use the cut and paste method. 
Thanks. That's fascinating. Thank you. Samara, did you want to chime in at all on the, the example we gave from uh, Wrangell Island? Wrangell Island. I love the Wrangell Island just because it's it's so exotic. crazy <laughs> in the sense that the Arctic is exotic, I guess. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I was really interested to see that, actually, because um, that particular project, because there are so many names, we've actually changed the way we, we are collecting them. So you took a screenshot kind of right in between Okay. our old way and our new way of collecting names so if you were to go back now you'd see the drop down menu is not there anymore because oh, really yeah because we just we just have too many names um and it was not user friendly enough for to be able to make it alphabetical and so we actually are just having those four fields below um four fields for authors four fields for recipients and we're asking the crowd to input names down there because there are cases where there are multiple authors or it's a copy of a letter sent to someone else of you know it we just found that it was getting really complicated so the new system is working out pretty well we think <laughs> and we might even add another um a title generation field to it now um, to help with our export of TEI text. Yeah. We'll be interested to see how you do reconciliation of names and, and people against, you know, creating authorities or something like that down the line. We'll, we'll, it'll be we'll fun ask that time. next month when Samara is one of our speakers. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I could probably talk about it then too, um, but it's such a huge project that It'll probably change a couple more times before the end. We're only on folder nine out of 40. So <laughs> it's a big project. But yeah, um, it's been interesting to learn about the different ways we can use the metadata for sure. Any other questions or comments for us or <laughs> anyone else? <laughs> Um, this is more just a comment, um, and I don't know if anyone else has maybe had the same experience. When we have asked um, the general public to help identify people, places, or, or even things in photographs, um, and this was before we were using from the page, at the time we were using the Omeka Scripto combo, um, when we did put collections of photographs up, asking for that type of information, what we actually received was the alt text, um, essentially. Because, you know, I think people would happen across these, not really understand what we were asking for. They would be supplying the sort of, oh, these are two people in a photograph. Um, and they're looking at, you know, the horizon or something like that. So we often have trouble maybe getting from users the information that we actually want. Um, so I don't know if that is, in some ways, from the page makes it much more clear because you can add instructions. Um, closer to the actual work area. But I think that just working on that type of instruction is always a challenge for us. Um, if anyone else has similar experiences or has solutions, I've not thought of, I'd love to hear. Yeah, we're we're gonna be very interested in watching how people use that because from my understanding, the alt text description is very different from a caption. And you're, you know, with captions, you can provide all, you can say, this is a picture of Ulysses S. Grant, but with alt text, you need to say things like, here's a guy in a military uniform and a beard and things like that. So we'd, we're going to be really interested oh. in watching this. And there's, there's kind of a third piece to describing photographs. We had this conversation, gosh, probably 10 years ago with uh, Ashley Yandel, who at the time was at the North Carolina State Archives, and she had done her, her I guess, master's thesis for her um, her library degree on how people ask for images and how that's different from how, you know, librarians and archivists describe images. Because a lot of times what people are looking for are like cool vintage photographs of pigs, right? Well, like to, to hang in their barbecue restaurant, right? It, it's, Which is a, I think, valid, right? I mean, it's a cool thing to do with, with archival uh, uh, items, but I'm not sure that either alt text or, you know, our kind of traditional description 
necessarily gets you there. So, you know, in some sense, maybe having the public use their words to describe what it is might get you there. I don't know. It's an interesting question. Well, we'll continue to work on that and think on it. Um, I love any additional resources that you all have about image tagging. I think that's a, an interesting use of crowdsourcing. Yeah, it's... Yeah, I mean, it's, there, there's there's a whole rabbit hole you can go down into. One of the very first crowdsourcing, like library and information science crowdsourcing projects I ever worked on was a, uh, it was the Netherlands National Archives and they had posted their material online, uh, their their special collections online. There were all these um, photos with captions, and the captions were were printed. And they were asking people to uh, please type the caption in a comment field on Flickr, and pretty rapidly, people started creating translations. So they'd say, "Okay, well, here's I, I've transcribed the caption in Dutch." But, you know, I'm going to translate it into French, and I'm going to translate it into English, and I'm going to translate it into German. And they were, these were just people who were kind of practicing their Dutch, I guess, on this really fun material because you just had a couple of sentences and a picture of, you know, some part of a tennis ball factory or something. And, you know, it was it was this kind of spontaneously generated internationalization effort revolving around special collection photograph captions. It was, just, it was delightful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I sometimes have users who offer to translate things for us, but I don't have any anywhere to put those <laughs> translations. Um, and I always try to um, take people up on what they're offering. So, so maybe this is another way to think of using those skills. Yeah, I think if I was, the field-based stuff is so hard to handle in translation, but like full text, I think you could, just do a PDF export of, of the translation and, and have it as a separate item, Spanish version of something like that. I don't know. Yeah. The, the where do you put the output of these these projects is is a really important question that everyone should be thinking about <laughs> um, because it's a hard question to answer sometimes. Um, but the other answer is maybe you just keep it up on a, a site like from the page because it's better than nothing. All right, uh, any other questions or comments before we wrap up? Um, as you can tell, we love to talk about this stuff. We're very passionate about what we do. So if you want to brainstorm projects, if you just want to talk through problems you're trying to solve, um, that crowdsourcing or transcription or the types of work that we've shown you today might help you solve, we're always happy to hop on a call. Um, yeah. Like, we don't care if you're not going to buy for five years or never. It's right. okay. <laughs> yes. Just want to have fun and talk and make friends. So uh, we'll we'll send out the recording for this um, probably Monday, and we'll include some some links to to the the video and anything else that we can think of. Yeah. So. Well, thank you all for attending, um, and thanks so much for um, everyone spending their time, uh, especially the folks in Australia for whom it's uh, almost quarter to three, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. All right. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.